Welcome. We're ready to begin our Sunday school uh, this morning, and I trust that um, you're ready to dig into God's Word. And as we continue our study, we're in chapter 9 of our book, Changed into His Image. And this section, of course, uh, is entitled Renewing the Mind, or Renewing Your Mind. And chapter 9 here talks about walking in wisdom. Um, we've talked uh, in the past two weeks uh, about this uh, the idea of seeking uh, for wisdom. And that is all a part of the idea of um, the, the two master disciplines of hearing and doing the Word of God. The hearing part was dealt with in chapter 8, where we talked about seeking for wisdom. Now the doing part is uh, chapter 9, walking in wisdom. And so let's have a word of prayer as we begin our study this morning. Father, we need your spirit to open our mind uh, to your truth. Help us to understand that which we need for our daily lives. And Lord, where we have been remiss in practicing the truth, I ask that your Holy Spirit would convict our hearts and bring us, Lord, to change. We thank you for uh, these wonderful truths that guide our lives, that direct our steps, that ultimately bring glory to yourself. Be glorified in our study this morning. Change our hearts as is needed, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So chapter 9, we're walking in wisdom. We referred um, last week and the week before to James chapter 1, verses 20 through 22. And verse 22 says, But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. And so chapter 9 here, we begin looking at the master discipline of doing. Last chapter we learned, or we looked at, the, the first master discipline of wisdom, and that was hearing. We learned that hearing consists of two basic disciplines, the discipline of attention and the discipline of meditation. We saw that Jesus taught in his Sermon on the Mount that doing is the second master discipline of those who would be wise. You remember our chart in the last chapter? Our chart in the last chapter also divided doing into two basic disciplines. And those disciplines were obedience and endurance. And so we'll talk about obedience today. We'll deal with endurance next week. And uh, those will be the subjects of the study in this chapter. So let's pause for a moment here and go to our objectives. Our knowledge objectives. What do we want to know? Well, first of all, we want to know how to explain the role of the Holy Spirit in our obedience to God. Secondly, we, we want to be able to understand that biblical obedience is not compliance with a rule, but a submissive response to a person. Thirdly, we want to understand that biblical endurance is fueled by a relationship with God. And as I said, we'll talk about endurance next week. And then lastly, we want to explain how the hearing and doing are ha hallmarks of mature Christianity. Now, how do we want this knowledge to be applied in our lives? Well, we want to apply this knowledge by responding, by becoming increasingly sensitive to the Holy Spirit's conviction in our life. Secondly, we want to respond by turning to God for help to obey and to endure. Thirdly, we want to respond by reflecting Christ to others around us by servanthood. So let's dig in here. Chapter 9, Walking in Wisdom, the Master Discipline of Doing. Let's talk about doing versus being. While much of what we look at here is about doing, it's important that we understand that Christianity is not made up of just the things we do or do not do. Okay, We've talked about our relationship with God. 
And uh, so we need to be careful not to misunderstood the issue. It, it has to be in, it has to be clear by now uh, that Christianity is essentially a, ra- a a relationship with God, not a set of rules. But at the same time, it should be clear to us that every relationship produces its own rules. Remember, we saw in the illustration last week that dating illustration, the rule. Thou shalt not bring her daisies, okay? The young man was dating a lady, or or a young lady who uh, was allergic to daisies. And we talked about the fact that if he really cared for her, he would learn to remember that she was allergic to daisies. And he wouldn't ever do anything, ever put her in harm's way by bringing her daisies. And so that was a rule that he had to abide by in that relationship. Every relationship generates laws that are consistent with the nature of the person that we are relating to. And it's no different in our relationship with God. Okay, We've talked about sanctification. In that first chapter, we talked about the fact that it is a cooperative venture between God and us. That is not man's idea and does not in any way d- detract from God's sovereignty. God set it up that way to be a cooperation. So we need to get it straight that God himself has determined that those who will be like his son and therefore uh, be wise will be doing certain things. Okay, So it's not just about being, it's about what the being results in and that is doing, okay? So we're focusing on doing this week. Let's talk about the key player. Now, uh, I didn't mark my book, so I may have to toggle back and forth in this PowerPoint here, but we see the first point here about the key player. The key player is the Holy Spirit. Remember, we're talking about doing. Okay? Being a not just a hearer of the word, but a doer of the word. And when we talk about being a doer of the word, we have to understand, naturally we would think, oh, well, I'm the key player in the doing. No, nope, not at all. The key player in the doing is the Holy Spirit. And you'll understand as we continue through this chapter what's meant by that. It's important for us to remember that we cannot do any hearing unless the Holy Spirit teaches us God's word as we are bending over, peering intently at it. Do you remember that from last week? Uh, We talked about the Holy Spirit's role in teaching us God's word. We even touched on that a good bit in the morning uh, message last week. We looked specifically at 1 Corinthians 2, 9 through 16, and we found that the Holy Spirit is the one who illuminates our minds. Just as the Holy Spirit is a key player in the hearing aspect of gaining the Christ-like wisdom of a renewed mind, he also is central in the doing aspect. Our flesh, we often we, we often find, uh, begs us to obey its lusts. Galatians 5.16 really captures the nature of the battle. And, and those, those two verses, 16 and 17, say, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. All right? So we see Paul really lays out the battle there. It is a battle between the flesh and the spirit. Paul and other biblical writers speak much of doing, but doing is a response of obedience to God the Holy Spirit. And it is to be energized by him. We call this obedience to the spirit, walking in the spirit, or being controlled by the Holy Spirit. 
And so we have to have a fuller understanding of the Holy Spirit's role in our lives. If we're going to understand the kind of doing that Jesus was calling for in Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 through 27. Do you remember that? The parable of the wise man who built his house upon the rock. There's a lot of confusion today in regard to the Holy Spirit's ministry in our lives. So let's kind of back up and explore the foundations of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. From the moment of salvation, the Holy Spirit is God's resident agent. He personally handles every transaction that goes on between us and God. He, he has a continual presence in our lives, and that gives us the, the opportunity for a continual fellowship with God. So the Holy Spirit's presence within us is also the permanent seal or mark of ownership that we are indeed God's child. You see that in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, and Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. But in addition to him being the seal, his presence within us is also the earnest, or we would say in today's terms, the guarantee or the down payment. And he, uh, uh, the Holy Spirit, as our earnest, assures us that God will bring us into total likeness of Christ when we finally stand in his presence in heaven. So we see that he is the seal, the mark of ownership upon our lives. He is the earnest or the down payment that we will be brought to full maturity, full perfection in Christ. Of course, that will, uh, that will culminate uh, in God's literal presence in heaven. And from that base of operation within us, we find that the Holy Spirit has other roles within our life, too. Number one, he convicts of sin that would hinder our fellowship with the Father. We find that in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 17, 1 Thessalonians 4, 7 and 8. He convicts us. He also teaches us. Uh, we referenced that in our Sunday morning sermon last week. He teaches us more of Christ so that our fellowship with him is enriched. And then he also assists us in our work for Christ. We looked at John 14, 26 and John 15, 26 in the morning message last week when we talked about renewing the mind. And in those scriptures, the Holy Spirit was referred to as the comforter. In that sense, he has the idea of one who comes alongside to help. We could say a, a helper. How blessed we are to have within us God's personal agent who serves as an, an arresting officer, right? He convicts us of sin. Uh, he serves as our private tutor. He teaches us. And then he serves as our personal assistant or helper in order to carry out his mission of establishing and maintaining our fellowship with God. But there's much more to the Holy Spirit's role in us. His permanent presence not only allows continual fellowship with God as we respond to his conviction and we heed his teaching, but he also empowers us to be what we ought to be, that's sanctification, right? And do what we ought to do, that's service. And that all takes place as the Holy Spirit fills us. And we'll talk about that filling here in just a minute. You remember the illustration from, I think it was chapter one, of the farm machinery that the grandfather of the author used to do work in his fields? In that same way, we talked about that farm machinery and how it did the work uh, but the grandfather directed it, right? He yielded control to that machinery. We talked about the fact that every believer has to yield to the power of the Holy Spirit to do the work of God and to reflect his nature. These cannot be done in and of ourselves. 
Every Christian has to understand and practice what it means to be controlled or filled, filled with the Holy Spirit. So let's talk about being controlled by the Spirit, because you can't understand this master discipline of doing without understanding the idea of being controlled by the Holy Spirit. Let's see if I'm caught up here in the, in the slides here. Galatians 5, 16, and 17. And uh, we'll come here then to this next point in a moment. But let's talk, to, let's talk to the truth of being controlled by the Holy Spirit. The indwelling uh, of the Spirit is the birthright of every believer. In other words, when you're saved, you have been uh, given the inheritance or the right of the indwelling Holy Spirit. The indwelling should not be confused with the control of the Spirit. Okay? The control of the Spirit is conditional. The indwelling of the Spirit is unconditional. In other words, when you're saved, you receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit regardless of any circumstances. There are no conditions to the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. But there are conditions to the, to, to the filling of the Holy Spirit. We could say it this way. Every believer has the Spirit's presence in his life, but not every believer has the Holy Spirit's power in his life. And so one of the New Testament expressions of the Holy Spirit's empowering work is found in Ephesians 5.18. Most of us are probably well familiar with that verse, which states, And be not drunk with wine, but be filled with with the Spirit. Be not drunk with wine, excuse me, I left out a little phrase there, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Now the word filled here <clears throat> is not speaking of possessing a certain quantity of the Spirit as we might speak of a glass filled with water. It expresses instead the idea of control, as when we speak of someone being Filled with rage. We mean by that phrase that, that anger is such a dominant part of that person's life at the moment that he is controlled by it. He's filled with rage, or in other words, we're saying he is controlled by rage. We might speak of somebody being filled with fear or filled with lust in the same way. That person is described being described as being filled with these passions because he is so consumed, consumed by the fear, consumed by the lust, that his behavior is noticeably affected. That's the idea of being filled with the Holy Spirit. Paul compares being filled with the Spirit to being drunk with wine. Now, a man who is filled with wine to the extent of drunkenness behaves differently when he is under the influence of, than when he is sober, right? He is transformed into a destructive, wasteful person by the influence of that alcohol. It affects every part of the man's life, but it affects his life in a destructive way. And that's why Paul says the effect of drunkenness is excess. He says, and be not drunken, drunk with wine, wherein is excess. That word excess means wastefulness. In drunkenness, there is great wastefulness. That's the effect of being controlled by alcohol. A Christian under the control of the Holy Spirit is also transformed, but in the opposite way. Not in a destructive way, but in a useful way. He too comes under the influence, the controlling influence of the Holy Spirit. And it transforms him so that he walks differently. The Bible says that God worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure, Philippians 2.13. Notice that this work is in you, okay? Now, who indwells us? Who is in us, working in us to will and to do of God's good pleasure? Well, that's the Holy Spirit. He indwells, and so he by the will of the Father, is working in us to will and to do of his good pleasure. So let's notice these two things that the Holy Spirit does in us. First of all, he creates within us 
a will or a desire to do what pleases him. Now, if you have any desire to please God, if you have any desire to do what is right, it's the Holy Spirit who put that desire within you. It doesn't come naturally. It's God's will being performed in you. God's Spirit put that desire there. We've already learned that left to ourselves, there is none that seeketh after God, Romans 3.11. He wants us to please God, and he wants us to want to do so as well. And so the Spirit's work is to put that desire in our hearts. But secondly, we see that he creates in us an ability to do God's pleasure. It is God that worketh in you both to will and and to do of his good pleasure. And so he creates in us not just a desire to do God's pleasure, but a uh, 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 an ability to do God's pleasure, to will and to do. And so you can be assured that if God puts a desire in you to please God, if, excuse me, if the Holy Spirit puts in you a desire to please God, he is doing so because he expects to enable you to do just that. He doesn't create a desire in us for something that can't be accomplished. The Greek word for do in this verse is the word from which we get the word energy. He gives us divine energy, the power to please God. Okay, so we see to will and to do. We see the desire and the ability that the Holy Spirit works within us. Let's talk about the idea of grace. This divine help of the Holy Spirit in creating a desire and giving us the power to please God is called grace. It is his undeserved help to accomplish what pleases him. And what's more, he is willing to give us all the grace, all of the divine help that we need to do what he requires. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 8, Paul said, And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye, always having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. Do you see the completeness there? There is no lack of God's help, of God's grace. It's a powerful promise. He will always give us everything we need to do, whatever he asks us to do. And so, I guess my question for you this morning is, what battle are you facing with your flesh right now? What habit are you struggling with? What bitterness or anger is staying unresolved within your heart? You know, God promises to always give you everything you need to do, whatever it is that pleases him in that situation. With God's help, you can always make the, the, the next right response. His grace is mediated to us by the Spirit as we, as we say no to the flesh and as we say yes to God. Here's how Peter puts it. 1 Peter 5.5, 5. God resisteth the proud, that's the person insisting on going his own way, and giveth grace, right? We talked about that being divine help or assistance, to the humble or the person that is submitting to God's way. And so as long as we are insisting that we have our own way, we can expect God to resist us. But when we get into our place as a submissive creature, God immediately, or the Holy Spirit immediately, gives us sufficient grace so that we can always make the next right response of obedience. Let me see if I'm caught up here on my PowerPoint. All right, so we're going to talk about the biblical discipline of obedience. Let's talk about how this relationship of obedience to the Spirit of God works out in a real-life situation. Let's suppose that your Christian friend John had been 
convicted by God from his word that he must stop lying. It must be put off, as Paul says, or laid aside. So he realizes that he is especially susceptible to lying when his image before others is at stake. Suppose he says to himself, I must stop this bad habit of lying. It always gets me into more trouble than it's worth. I may look, I may look better at first, but it seems I always get found out and I end up looking like a real idiot. Therefore, I must remember not to lie when I am tempted to do so. <clears throat> now, let's examine the scenario for a moment. Here John is trying to stop lying for the same selfish reason that he started lying, to enhance his image before others. He started lying to look good, and now he's realizing that in the end, it doesn't make him look so good, so he has to stop to make himself look good. His motive for now telling the truth is as self-centered as his motive for lying in the first place. His primary concern is still his image. So he's not going to be successful for very long. In the end, he will always choose to do what advances his own cause the most, given the circumstance. He will no doubt be quite discouraged because he cannot seem to give up his bad habit of lying. Notice that there is no personal submission to God in this situation. Your friend John cannot lie without showing enormous disrespect for the very nature of God. Jesus described himself as the way, the truth, and the light. The Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of Truth. Suppose that John knows that you, his friend, are allergic to a certain cologne. And so let's further suppose that even though he knows this, he wears it around you anyway. He's not showing any concern about how his behavior will affect you. He's thinking only of what he likes. And so in much the same way, because of his nature, God is allergic to lies. Even more fundamentally offensive to God is the whole mindset of John is the whole mindset that John's way should take precedence over his way, since he is John's creator and John's redeemer. God is a person who dwells within us in the person of his Holy Spirit. He's personally wronged when his nature is violated. And so that's why Paul warns us, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, Ephesians 4.30. His work in us is quenched or hindered by our selfishness. So let's, let's go over again the scene with John from the standpoint of a person desiring to be controlled by the Holy Spirit of God. John knows from the Bible that lying is wrong. He's been convicted by the Holy Spirit when he has lied in the past. And so he says to himself, I cannot continue to grieve God in this way. My lying shows that I'm more concerned about myself in what I want than about God in what he deserves and demands. So John then might express his heart's desire to God in a prayer like this. Dear God, you are so patient to me. You have watched me lie over and over again, and yet you have not dealt harshly with me for violating your very nature of truth. You have faithfully convicted me by your Holy Spirit. I know I've grieved you by my deception. Forgive me for my selfish image for my own, excuse me, my selfish concern for my own image. I want to be concerned only about how I portray the image of Christ to others through my life. I will need the help of your Holy Spirit to renew my mind as I meditate upon Ephesians 4.15 and 4.25 and other passages about your hatred for lying and deception. May he enlighten my heart with an understanding of your ways, continue to convict me by your Spirit, and help me to be sensitive to his conviction. Help me to speak the truth at all times, no matter what the cost. Help me to be willing to deny everything, including a good image before others.' 
in order not to deny what is rightfully yours, a life that represents you well. Help me to that end. In Jesus' name, amen. When John comes to God with this kind of heart, demonstrated in this prayer, he will receive divine help or grace from the Holy Spirit in order to, re to resist his temptation to lie. The Holy Spirit will, in the process, be helping him to become like Christ. Christ was a truth teller. Christ didn't lie. And so the Holy Spirit will give him grace, enablement, assistance to tell the truth like Christ. And so the key element that we see here in John's heart is, is humility. David spoke much of this needed element of the heart, humility. Psalm 34, 18, the Lord is nigh or near unto them that are of a broken heart and saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. For thou desirest not, this is, I'm sorry, Psalm 51, 15, and 16, thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. See, God himself showed his high esteem for such a heart in Ephesians, excuse me, Isaiah 66, 1 and 2. He said that he is not looking for any dwelling that man can build. After all, heaven itself is his throne, and he rests his feet upon the footstool of the earth. How can man impress him with anything man can build? He did say, however, that there is one thing that always arrests his attention and causes him to look with interest and offer willing assistance. And that is a man or a woman who humbles himself before his God, a man or woman who will take his word seriously. So this is how he put it. Thus saith the Lord, the heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that ye will build unto me? And where is the place of my rest? For all those things hath mine hand made, and all those things have been, saith the Lord. But to this man will I look, even to him that is, that is of a poor and of a contrite spirit, and trembleth at my word. What a statement. The kind of humility reflected in John's prayer showed itself in three ways. John was repentant. He knew he needed God's forgiveness. He was submissive. He knew he needed to subject himself to God and God's ways. And then he was dependent. He knew he couldn't resist sin effectively without the supernatural help of God. And so at that moment of repentive, uh, excuse me, repentant, submissive, dependent humility, John needed God's attention, or excuse me, John received God's attention and assistance. The Holy Spirit was pleased in that moment, not grieved. The Spirit of God was also now free to give John the power he needed since he did not need to resist John any longer. And that same expression from his heart would need to be offered to God many times in the days ahead and many times during each of those days for John to see any lasting change in his pattern of lying. John is practicing putting off the ways of the flesh. And as he is hearing and doing what the Holy Spirit says, he is developing the mind of Christ. He is being renewed in the spirit of his mind, Ephesians 4.23. He is handling life wisely. And so his life is going to demonstrate an increasing stability and fruitfulness for Christ. I hope that's your desire. You see, biblical obedience is not just compliance to some abstract law or rule. It is the submissive response to the person of the Holy Spirit who has revealed the will of God to us 
through his word. Biblical obedience, get this, is not just compliance to some abstract law or rule. It is the submissive response to the person of the Holy Spirit who has revealed the will of God to us through his word. It means saying yes to God as we say no to self. It means denying self instead of indulging self. It means pleasing God instead of pleasing self. It means walking in the Spirit instead of grieving the Spirit. It is the way of wisdom instead of the way of the fool. Biblical obedience is more than just commandment-oriented living versus desire or feeling-oriented living. While commands must be obeyed and feelings may need to be ignored, the issue cannot or excuse me, the issue can be more fundam fundamentally stated as a flesh versus spirit issue. We are either obeying our flesh or and pleasing ourselves, or we are obeying the Holy Spirit and pleasing God. You see, at, at the heart of obedience is a love relationship. We will always please the one we love the most. If we love God the most, we'll please him. If we love ourselves the most, we will please ourselves. Deuteronomy 6.5 commands us to love God with all of our heart, with all our soul, with all our might. Paul emphasizes this same kind of wholehearted obedience in Colossians 3, 23 and 24. And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. In the small book of Malachi, God confronted the Israelites for their lack of devotion for him. He said, a son honoreth his father and a servant his master. If then I be a father, where is mine honor? And if I be a master, where is my fear? Malachi 1.6. The people respond with surprise in verse 8. Wherein have we despised thy name? God answered with their less than wholehearted devotion to him. Excuse me, God answered that. Their less than wholehearted devotion to him was evidenced by the quality of sacrificial lambs they were bringing to him every day. He, charted, he chided them with these words. And if ye offer the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? And if ye offer the lame and sick, is it not evil? Offer it now unto the governor. Will he be pleased with thee or accept thy person, saith the Lord of hosts? You see, the Lord's test here is simple and foundational. We always reserve the best for the one we love the most. A child picks out for himself the biggest piece of cake with the most frosting. Why? Because he loves himself the most. He will enthusiastically defend himself when accused of wrongdoing, even if he's guilty, because he loves himself the most. He'll want to be the first in line in the cafeteria at school. He'll want to be the first to be picked for the team on the ball field. He will want to be the first out the door at recess. This love for himself is evidenced by the way he wholeheartedly looks out for himself and gives himself the best options. God rebukes his people in Malachi's day. When they reserved the best lamb in the flock for themselves instead of offering it to God, God challenged them about their lack of love for him. He said, in essence, if you offered to your civic leaders the kind of diseased, crippled gifts you give to me, they'd throw you out. You're treating your governors better than you're treating your God. And then he pronounced a coming punishment upon those who tried to get by with inferior sacrifices. Malachi 1.14 But cursed be the deceiver, which hath in his flock a male, and voweth, and sacrificeth unto the Lord a corrupt thing. For I am a great king, saith the Lord of hosts, and my name is dreadful among the heathen. 
Anyone who watched an Israelite lead a crippled lamb to the sacrificial altar had every right to judge the devotion of that Israelite to God. His inferior gift to God meant that he was keeping the best lambs at home for himself. And the quality of sacrifice betrayed whom he loved most, himself or God. So it was a simple test. Whoever got his best lamb, himself or God, was the one he loved most. And that is the nature of obedience. It is a reflection of the heart. Make sure here that I'm caught up on my PowerPoint. Next week we'll talk about the second basic discipline of doing. We saw the first one this week, obedience. Next week we'll look at endurance. I trust you've been challenged in regard to your obedience to God. I trust that you've been challenged in regard to the way in which you allow the Holy Spirit to function within you. He's there inside. In a sense, he's sitting right next to you right now, watching how you respond to God's truth that it's been presented this morning. The Holy Spirit is next to you every moment of every day. He's there to, uh, to convict you. He's there to teach you. He's there to assist you, to give you power to obey. How are you responding to him? Lord, we thank you for the Holy Spirit. Thank you for the promise of his filling, his controlling work within our hearts and lives. And I pray, dear God, that he would help us with his power to effectively evaluate our relationship with you and his work within us. Help us to be honest, that we might be obedient, Lord, that we might be not just hearers of the word, but doers also. We thank you for the way in which you'll use these truths in our lives this week and in the, week, and in the weeks to come. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. If there's any part of this that you had questions about, anything you need to understand further, feel free to reach out to me with any questions you may have. I'd love to, to uh, help answer those questions.